in your Bibles, if you turn to the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 1, and planning for 2019, we're going to be having some messages from one of my favorite New Testament books. I love the book of Hebrews. And, and one of the reasons I love the book of Hebrews, uh, Hebrews so well is because Jesus Christ is presented, He's exalted. One of the key words that you're going to see throughout the book of Hebrews is the word better or superior. Jesus Christ is superior to the Old Testament prophets. He's superior to the angels. He's superior to Moses. He's superior to all these various things. He is greater than the Levitical priesthood because he comes from the order of Melchizedek. And so we're going to see throughout this book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ is better. Today's message is the exalted Christ. We're just going to be looking at the first three verses of chapter 1. I came across in a devotion yesterday morning uh, written by Henry Blackaby and his son Richard Blackaby experiencing God day by day a devotional written in 1997 it says Christianity is an intimate growing relationship with the person of Jesus Christ it is not a set of doctrines to believe habits to practice or sins to avoid Every activity God commands is intended to enhance His love relationship with His people. God designed worship for us to see Him in His glory and to respond appropriately. For many it has degenerated into religion. One more meeting to attend out of habit. God established the sacrificial system so that we, His people, could express our love to Him. But we often diminish our gifts to our Lord into futile attempts to appease Him and to pacify our guilty conscience. God gave us prayer so we could have conversation with Him, but often distort this by saying prayers and hurrying off without ever listening to what is on our Father's heart. God instituted His commandments as a protection for those He loves, but the commandments can become a pathway to legalism rather than an avenue for a relationship with our Father in which He protects us from harm. Religious activity apart from fellowship with God is empty ritual. The people of Jeremiah's day were satisfied to have the ritual without the manifest presence of God. They became so comfortable with their religion that they didn't even notice God's absence. Is it possible to pray, to attend a worship service, or to give an offering yet not to experience the presence of God? It certainly is possible. And that has been the sad commentary on many a Christian experience. Don't settle for a religious life that lacks a vital relationship to Jesus Christ. When God is present, the difference will be obvious. We must have our focus upon Jesus Christ. We're running this race here on this earth but just as that runner, the marathon runner, is focused on that finish line, is focused, isn't looking around at all the people around them, or those that would be in a, a race in a track. I was never fast enough in school to be in track, but <laughs> those that would run track and, and the, the various things, they're not sidetracked. They're not looking up in the stands and seeing all who's there. They're focused on running and staying focused ahead. And Jesus Christ is saying, focus on me. And so Hebrews chapter 1, we're going to see the exalted Christ. Your first point on the outline is the Son more than the prophets. He is superior to the prophets. And point A in verse 1, God has spoken. How could we know God if He has not spoken? How could we know Him if He did not choose to reveal Himself unto us? We wouldn't. But here's the glorious words that happened both in verse 1 and verse 2. 
God has spoken. He's not like the idols that the children of Israel, when they got off away, turned away from the Lord and, and started setting up idols for themselves. Had the silversmiths to make these images that had ears and had a mouth, but they didn't speak. And they couldn't hear. Remember that scene on the, with Elijah and you had the prophets of Baal? And Elijah said, you go first. <laughs> the 450 prophets of Baal, and there were 400 of the, of the Asherah, there were 850 total of these. Uh, and, and Elijah says, hey, I'm alone left. You know, Jezebel and, and Ahab, you, look what you've done to the prophets of the Lord. He thought he was the only one left. And so he says, the God that answers by fire is God, worship him. And they were calling out to Baal, and they, and remember Elijah saying, call louder, maybe, maybe you need to wake him. Maybe he's preoccupied. He, he's not answering. And then so Elijah says, he repaired the altar. And so said, go get the water. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? There's going to be the one that answers by fire, but he says, go get the water. And the water is filled up, and we need more water. And so the water around the trenches, and then the Lord answers by fire. The God who speaks, follow him. The God who answers. Well, God has spoken. And we see in, in Hebrews 1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, in the prophets. In the original language, the, the emphasis is really put on this last phrase. The place of emphasis in verse 1 is on in many portions and in many ways. God has spoken long ago to the fathers in the prophets. He has spoken. Andrew Murray, in his book that he wrote in 1894, writes the following, When God, who dwells in light that is inaccessible, speaks out of the height of his glory, it is that he may reveal himself. He would have us know how he loves us and longs for us, how he wants to save and to bless, how he would have us draw nigh and live in fellowship with himself. Friend, as you're reading the Old Testament, I would really encourage you to mark how many times you come across the phrases in the Old Testament, the Lord says, or thus says the word of the Lord. What God is saying, and as he speaks to the prophets, and God was speaking because he had a message. He had a message for his people. He has a message. As we open up the scriptures, we are ready to hear. We need to have the prayer of Samuel. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. But are we ready to listen? Speak, Lord. Speak through your word. So God has spoken. In the past, in various ways, he spoke to the prophets. And then verse 2, in these last days... Here's the last days. The last days began with the first coming of Jesus Christ, with his advent. What we just were celebrating with the birth of Christ, that began the last days. And that will go until his second coming. So we are truly living in the last days. So this period of time, in the last days, God has spoken to us through a son. Actually, his is not a part of the original there. The focus is on the, the sonship of Jesus Christ, who he is. But God has spoken to us through his own son, Jesus Christ. So we think about the full revelation the very last book of the Bible is Revelation. And who's it the revelation of? Jesus Christ. 
in what John sees in John in, in Revelation chapter 1, he sees the living Christ. And he falls down, doesn't he? Have you ever noticed when people would see the glory of the Lord? What's the reaction? They fall before him. I really believe that's what we're going to do in heaven. We're going to fall before the Lord in his glory. The full revelation in these last days has spoken to us in the Son. Westcott has written, there is a contrast in the method. He spoke to the prophets in various ways. There's a contrast in the method in these days. He has spoken to us through his Son. In the time, in the agents of the two revelations, through Christ. We always get into trouble when somebody says, I have a word from the Lord, and it does not line up with scriptures. What about the groups that say, oh, I have another testament? When I've witnessed to Mormons before, I used to see in Johnstown a lot that the bike path, there was a couple young men they were Mormon missionaries. And they had their name tags. And, and I remember telling them. I always tell them exactly what the Apostle Paul said in Romans to the unbelieving Jews. I said, you know, you have a zeal. They do have a zeal. Those that are willing to leave home and go to wherever for a period of time... There's a zeal. And I say, you have a zeal. But here's a problem. I said, here's the reality. Jesus Christ. It's what this verse says. He's the final revelation. And as soon as you start talking about another testament or another book, that violates the very teaching of this word. So when they'll say, oh, can I tell you about this and this and this? And I say, with all due respect, that is not in line with the God of the Bible. We can be forthright in a respectful way but we can call air, air. <laughs> and so what happens? They're saying there's still another revelation. All these cults were based upon some re you know, revelation that they're claiming. But it violates the very word of God. So what is the test? Scripture. The supreme authority of the Word of God. Does it line up with Scripture? Bruce was talking about this in the Sunday school class this morning. I'm always amazed how many times in the sermon as I'm studying that it, it, things line up so well from the Sunday school class to what I'm studying for the Scripture, you know, for the sermons. But one of the things that is true is we must test things according to the Scriptures. We must take the Word of God. We must examine to see if it, these things are so. And indeed, the Holy Spirit, He does alert to us when we hear something that is off, doesn't line up. What do we have? We have a biblical responsibility to reject that which is not in line with the Word of God. Amen? And I have news for you. As we get closer and closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, this will increase. I can't keep up with all the isms. There's too many of them. I cannot keep up with all the different false teachings that are arising, and even those that are arising under the realm of evangelicalism. And there is some false teaching arising even under the realm of evangelicalism. But what do we have to do? 
We need to know the Word so that we can say, does that line up? And God has spoken. He has spoken to us in the last days through His Son and in His Son, Jesus Christ. He came to reveal the Father. And through the Son, there is the fulfillment of what is promised in the Old Testament. Let's go to point two, the Son, the glory of His person. There's some powerful statements in verses two and three about Jesus, and we want to examine them today. First of all is the program for the future. In verse two, whom He appointed heir of all things. Keep your finger there in Hebrews and go back to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I mentioned the book of Revelation. Whenever you study the scriptures and you're studying the end times, uh, you study the book of Revelation, you're going to be going back a lot to Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Because Jesus Christ was faithful, he was obedient to the will of the Father, he went to the cross, he accomplished our redemption, he rose again the third day, he ascended, just like the scriptures said he would, he's at the right hand of the Father, but the reality is, he is the king. And there's a coming kingdom. So you have here even that it says he's appointed heir of all things. Because he was obedient, he has been appointed the heir. You can say, indeed, that's a verse showing that Jesus Christ is king. I didn't have that reference on your notes of Daniel 7, 13, and 14, but that shows well what will take place. He will rule here on this earth, eternal kingdom. The purpose in everything. Verse 2 says, Through whom also he made the world. The word for world actually is better translated ages. He made the ages. So you have the purpose in everything. The Nelson Study Bible puts it this way, The Son is the Lord of all history. History truly is his story. <laughs> you cannot study history apart from the sovereign lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even the founding of our country. Boy, it breaks my heart today that people want to try to make them out to be all these secularist, naturalist thinking, or atheistic not all of the founders were Christians, but many were. Many that put their signatures on the founding documents were willing to take that risk and that sacrifice. How many of their writings are talking about the Lord Jesus Christ? Isn't that something to have a president call for a national day of not only prayer, but of fasting? Humiliation before the Lord. What humility. Saying, we need you, Lord. Our nation, we need you. We need to seek you. The purpose in everything. That through Christ, he made the ages. Jesus Christ is the creator. We see that in Colossians chapter 1. We see that in John chapter 1. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Jesus Christ, 
the purpose and everything. Go to verse 3. The person of God. He is God. He is deity. He is the radiance of his glory. The word radiance, is, this is very important. Jesus Christ is not reflecting the glory. It is the brightness. It is his own brightness, his glory. He is God, his deity. He doesn't reflect like the moon does. The author of Hebrews is emphasizing it's not a reflected brightness. Instead, this is an inherent brightness like a ray from the sun. Jesus' glorious brightness comes from being essentially divine. Remember the Mount of Transfiguration? What happened? There was the brightness of Jesus' glory. I already referenced Revelation chapter 1. What did John see? He fell like as a dead man. Why? the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. There were times where that was veiled. I believe as they came out to the garden to arrest Jesus, and Jesus stepped forward and said, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus stepped forward and says, I am. Unfortunately, in our Bibles, there's italicized words that are added for emphasis that are not part of the original. And, and sometimes they don't help. <laughs> and this is one of those instances where it says, I am he. That he is not there. It's I am. It's the name Jehovah, Yahweh. He is saying, I am. And when Jesus said, I am, they fell backwards. They got a glimpse of his glory. Now we would expect that they would right away be ready to repent and say, we are sinners before a holy and righteous God. But that's not what they did. Jesus said again to them, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, here I am. Let them go. So they came to arrest Jesus. But they saw a glimpse of his glory. The brightness of his glory. And it says, the exact representation of his nature. The imprint, the exact representation. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 puts it this way, In him the fullness of deity dwells. He is God. When Jesus came to this earth and put on flesh, he never stopped being God. Now the whole idea of the word kenosis in Philippians 2 of laying aside certain privileges that he had of deity didn't mean stop being God. But he laid aside certain privileges. But he is God. He is Lord. He's the perfect imprint, the very image of God's nature. He's also the preserver of all things. Upholds all things by the word of of his power. When he created all things, he just didn't say, okay, <laughs> I turn it over, it, it just, it'll go on its own now. The Lord upholds all things by the word of his power. That's power, amen? When the Lord Jesus says, peace, be still, the storm as the waves are beating against Peace, be still. What happened? Was obedient. Because he is the creator. And he has the power. And he upholds by the very word of his power. That's who he is. Point three, the son, the glory of his work. When he had made purification of sins. When did he make purification of sins? 
Well, there in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 26 through 28... For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. How often? Once for all time, a finished, a completed redemption. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. Jesus Christ offered himself. We saw the king, he became the heir of all things. He's the priest. He offered himself. He paid the ultimate sacrifice once and for all. It's completed. And it was accepted. It was accepted. When he was able to say, it is finished, he didn't say, I am finished, but it is finished or paid in full. I love the statement that is, the resurrection was God the Father's amen to the Son's statement. It is finished. Completed. And today, He is at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. And because of that, people might say, Brian, why do you believe in security of the believer? Because who is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us that we would be saved to the uttermost? <laughs> if it's based upon us, we're in trouble. But aren't you grateful it's based upon what He's done and His completed work? So you have the purification of sins. That's what Jesus came to do. He made purification. He cleansed us. We're redeemed by His precious blood that He shed upon that cross. And then our final point is provision for the present. In verse 3, the latter part, He sat down. Friend, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't sit down because He was tired. There's a big difference between the earthly priest and Jesus Christ as the faithful high priest. The earthly priest couldn't sit down. Why? Their work was never completed. The work was never completed. But what did Jesus Christ do? He sat down. Because the work was completed. The work is done. That is such an important message. Because there are millions around the world that are in bondage to teaching that is not in line with the Word of God, thinking that they have to completely, you know, that this continuous crucifying of Christ over and over and over again. It doesn't line up. It doesn't line up with the truth that Jesus Christ died once. Completed the redemption. Oh, when we remember when we had the Lord's Supper, what are we doing? We're doing this in remembrance of me. It's a remembrance of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. A remembrance of his body that was given for us. In remembrance of the blood of the New Testament. It's a remembrance. It's an observation that we need. But oh, that is not imparting some type of grace to the one that is receiving the bread and the cup. 
there are a lot of, I, I'm blown away by the number of evangelicals that will use the word sacraments. Sacrament, that's the wrong word. We are, it's ordinance. Sacraments have the idea of imparting some type of grace. We don't have the sacraments. We have the ordinances. And it's not just semantics. It is an important difference. And I've read different writings before that have come from groups and, and they'll say, oh, they're talking about the sacraments. I'm thinking, that's not the correct teaching. I like, don't get me wrong, I like Our Daily Bread. But I've seen an Our Daily Bread writer before have this wrong. This is just an example of no matter what solid ministries and things, we need to not put down the Bible, but we need to check it out. I remember reading that devotional some time ago and thinking, alarm here. Hey, you're using the wrong word. It's not a sacrament. It's an ordinance. It's the completed work. The picture of Christ being seated it means the finished character of his once for all sacrifice. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 12. By this will we have been sanctified. The word sanctified here is uh, positionally, we have been set apart. This isn't talking about our spiritual growth, our progressive sanctification being saved, being made more and more like Christ. This is saying in verse 10, by this will we have been sanctified, positionally set apart for heaven, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. He's the faithful high priest. Friend, we've seen, even in these first th three verses of chapter 1, Jesus is the exalted Christ. He is superior to the prophets. We see the glory of his person. And we see the glory of his work. And he finished it. He finished his, he completed the work that he was sent to do. Have you received? Have you came to that point to realize, oh, I am guilty before you, God. But, oh, Jesus, you died on that cross. You took my sins. My cleansing is based upon your, your blood that was shed upon that cross. And he rose again the third day. He lives to make intercession for us. Oh, he gives aid to his people. Hebrews 4 says that he is there as the compassionate high priest. That we may come boldly to the throne of grace and find mercy and grace in time of need. As we have the invitation this day, you may enter in 2019 and say, you know... Lord, I need your mercy and your grace. There's a time of need. And we have that invitation to come boldly to the throne of grace. Because he lives forever to make intercession for us. We come on the basis of his worthiness, not our own. His righteousness applied to our account, not our righteousness. But we can come boldly to him. Heavenly Father, we pray right now. As we can see in scriptures, the exalted Christ. And Lord, if there be somebody here this day that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, that even today they would call out to you, Lord, for salvation. We've been told, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved relying upon your completed work for us, dying on the cross. Lord, we pray for those that know you that may be here today spiritually struggling. You said there's a race to run. 
Our Christian life can be compared to that race. And you are the beginning, the author and the finisher, the completer of the faith. But we're to run, having our eyes fixed upon you, Lord. Maybe there's somebody here that knows you as their Lord and Savior, but the honest truth is that you're speaking to their heart because they've got their eyes off of you. Oh, Lord, just like the hymn writer says, Oh, I'm prone to wander, to leave the God I love. Oh, take my heart, Lord, and seal it in my courts above with your, indeed your great love that, that, Lord, that we can look to you and thank you that we can run with our eyes fixed upon you. Whatever the need is today, I praise the Holy Spirit speaks to hearts that we respond to you. You are the exalted Christ, and we love you.